What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Supper Suite at TIFF 2022. We are here with the team behind Roost. Congratulations. Your movie kept me on my toes, and now I'm in an absolute panic to talk to you because how are we going to get into the details without spoiling all this movie? <laughs> I feel bad asking you for this, but Amy, can yes. you give us a synopsis of the movie? Because everyone out there might not know what the movie is because it is a festival debut. Yes, thank you so much. Um, the movie is about, we find a, a, this Anna, the character, main character, on the eve of her 17th birthday, and she is speaking online to a gentleman that is obviously not 17 and we sort of bear witness to what that is for her and also as a parent and then as the movie progresses we realize that relationship is more complicated than we think it is and twists and turns ensue and um and it really you know does have to do with both the the hubris of youth and also when you're an adult and you realize you haven't paid the bills from your past and the fallout might be on your children. That's the horror movie part for me. So I don't <laughs> thank you. Job. Is that good? I'm yeah. trying. I like that. I'm impressed. Yes, I feel like you. that was like a very thorough understanding of what the movie is, but <laughs> without spoiling it, yeah. it's, it's magic. Thank um, you. I feel like I need to take that when I want to ask someone spoiler questions and get into that, yeah. but I don't want to actually have them flat out ruin something. Yeah. Um, it's been a little while since your last feature. Yes. So why now and why roost for the next one? You know, the writer of Roost is a, a playwright out in New York named Scott Organ, who I adore, and he's a wonderful writer, and he sent me his play, and it was COVID times, and I said, not only is this a brilliant play, but it could be a brilliant movie for this moment. And one of the things that I love about his writing is that he refuses to demonize people and he sees humanity from a very full spectrum perspective. And I felt like that was a really good antidote to these times when we tend to be a little polarized in the way we think about each other and issues. Um, and for me personally, you know, I got to a place in my life where I felt like my family was in a stable place and my kids were a little bit older and um, I'd been working on some other things, but I love movies and I love storytelling so um it's time to get back in the saddle I met this one and it made it very easy <laughs> just for fun because this is where my mind goes when someone just like broadly says I love movies what is what is the movie or the performance you both saw early on that made you say to yourselves I have to get into this industry and no other industry out there Amy I never told you this because I was very embarrassed and shy about it. But when I was 11, my dad showed me Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And it's been my favorite movie ever That's since. so funny. You're just confessing <laughs> this on camera I right now. Never, <laughs> when he talked about we were filming, I was like, I can't do it. I can't tell her. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I think that's wonderful. I, you know, I, um, my favorite film when I was little was Singing in the Rain. And I loved it because of the vibrance, but it was also a, a, a bit of an indictment on Hollywood and every all of those dynamics. And um, I, I loved all that that brought to the table. And then, you know, by virtue of my upbringing, I got to see a lot of different performances and I got to see, you know, people that were so fearless in their responsibility to bring a character forth. And I thought that that's kind of an act of both civil disobedience and obedience at the same time that I thought was really interesting, so. Part of the reason that I sit in this chair and will never leave it. I love discussing what storytelling can bring in some of those respects. I did want to go back to the idea of this being a play, though, because one thing that always has me curious, because I feel like it's a very difficult part of the adaptation process, is how, how I guess, do you avoid your movie feeling like a play? Because I feel like that's often a criticism of play adaptations. But then also, like, what is something about the screen that brings something out of the play that the stage could never? It's a great question. I love the language of the camera. And I think we underestimate not only the way in which a camera can collapse time and space, um, but the way that you know humans can. And we are smarter than we give ourselves credit for. We can make logical leaps between A and B. You know, we don't we don't always have to see all the micro steps. And so with camera, because you can afford a point of view, it will help direct your eye the same way that words will. So I think a lot of it is just distilling. Um, some of those moments that don't need the words that can add the camera as point of view. And it makes it a little easier to pull it out of that sort of theater setting. 
I never realized that it was a play until I read the press notes. So great success in that department. Thank you. Man, Grace, I want to ask you about your character so badly. I don't want to go too far, though. What, what would you say is the biggest difference between what you thought of her and what you thought she was going to be on screen when you first signed on, when you first booked the role, compared to who she turned out to be in the final film? Well, I think a lot of the times with a subject matter revolving around a teenager, especially being um, in a relationship with someone older, they're often victimized and and they are made smaller and younger and more immature than they really are. And something that Amy and I talked about was Anna is a bit more mature for her age. It doesn't excuse her storyline and what happens, but it does bring a more grounding aspect behind her and a more relatable aspect to her, I think for more ages than just a teenager. She's not bratty or no. young the way a lot of teenagers are depicted nowadays. Yeah, and she, you know, she is the product of a single mom mm -hmm. and the kind of symbiotic relationship that that can be. And sometimes in order to make things work, it has to be a little bit of role reversal. Sometimes you're the child, sometimes you're the parent. And I think, you know, that's a condition that Anna grew up with very much. Um, and also, I mean, Grace brings to the table a kind of very quiet confidence that, you know, I think Anna really needed. And she had to be smart because we can't, you know, we don't want to undermine who she is. We don't want to say, oh, well, the only the only kid that would, would do this is somebody who's not very clever. I definitely felt what you were describing in terms of her maturity, but I also very much believe that she was still a teenager and had that youthfulness to her. So were there any particular scenes where you were kind of having a tough time figuring out how to have that shine through or how much compared to her maturity in the situation? I think Anna wanting to share her relationship with her mom is kind of where you see her younger um, self show through a bit more because it is something she's shy to share and less confident in with herself. Yeah, and we, we were calibrating this a little bit because she does go through a bit of a rites of passage throughout the film. So you have to kind of back up from that end moment and then you know say, okay, well, where do we need to start her out? Um, and she loses some of her naivete throughout. So you know, it's it was really kind of a marked calibration, and a lot of that is Scott because he's a very crafted writer. And then it was just you know piling on all of us and figuring out how to time that out. How about the mix of genres here? That was something that was very impressively done. It's like every single time I thought I knew what kind of movie that I was watching, it shifted. So was there any particular moment in the film or any particular genre that you found most difficult to work with in that respect? Well, I am so grateful that there are these genres to move the motor of the story along, right? Because I think that in the course of one day, I go through about 18 different genres <laughs> in my life, you know? <laughs> And so I just had to ground that in the fact that it's not actually that heightened. Like being a parent is a horror and suspense and psychological <laughs> thriller and, you know, drama and comedy all at once. And so I kind of leaned into that truth and still, you know, the, the sort of technique of, of some of those genres. And of course, Bobby Bukowski, who's my DP, could also, we could talk, okay, where, wh where are we at right now? You know, what are we trying to say with the camera in terms of genres? So... We were, you know, and he's such a master. I was just happy to be able to have that dialogue. Here's another question that I feel like it's going to be difficult to specify one answer to. But when I watch uh, movies with these types of situations where, like, the viewer needs to know that the main character is making a bad decision, <laughs> like, you need, you almost want to have that feeling of, like, no, why are you doing that? But at the same time, all of her decisions need to be justified and believable for the moment. Were there any particular decisions she makes where it found felt most difficult for you to balance that and make sure that you were kind of ticking both boxes in that respect? Well, I mean, I think I tend to project myself into those moments as a human being. And and if I if I feel like we don't understand the why, then we have to back up and say we have to we have to make sure this feels an, like an authentic choice. And as a parent, you know, you can sort of say that parent that comes up to the door and go, do I go in? Do I not go in? 
what's the downstream effect of this? You know, if I, if I hold my fist too tight, they're going to run away. If I'm too loose, they're going to be without boundaries, you know? So, um, it, it, again, it's sort of like that. You just have to sort of gut, gut check it a little bit about what would feel like we can understand that. I understand this character's choices, both from my past and also my present, you know, both as a parent and as somebody who went through some things as a young woman. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, but Grace, was there any particular scene or decision she makes in the movie that like you really had to sit with either for yourself or just talk through together to really wrap your head around what the motivation is for her to do a certain something? Um, I resonated with Anna's story on a very personal level. I have um, similar experiences as her. So every decision she made, I was like, she's handling this a little better than I did. I'll give her that. But overall, I understood everywhere where she was coming from. Well, I love talking about uh, finding the magic in the moment on set. I'm sure you prepped as much as you possibly could, but was there any particular scene in the movie where like you didn't really like feel the power that it could have until you were on set working with your scene partners? I think every scene with Kyle was just, Kyle Gallner is so talented. So every scene with him, I was like, whoa, I didn't think this would be as um, demanding and, and amazing as it could be, but he's just so brilliant that I felt like every scene I had with him, I was like, I have to step up my game. <laughs> he's one of my favorite performers in this he's business. He's so, and like, I, one day he'll get the credit he deserves. People I, talk about him, but not nearly enough. It's my fault he's not here right now. <laughs> he's going to go do a great movie and he's going to blow up. And he's just an incredible person. Yeah, he, yeah he's, uh, he's an incredibly hardworking actor and, you know, I, came from an acting background and so I know that your sparring partner is the thing that is the key mm -hmm. to you being the best you that you can be and of course you know Grace was bringing so much to the table that you want to make sure you're matching them with somebody that's going to bring so much to the table so it was really a uh, fun to watch. You gave me a competition it was yeah. so challenging. <laughs> Grace whether it was Kyle or anyone else you get to work with in the movie is there anyone who came to the table with a completely different process or approach to the work that makes you say that's an interesting technique I'm going to put it in my back pocket and try it on a future film? Um, I think actually with this project we all worked fairly similarly where we could run a scene a couple times with each other and then we would want to go sit with it ourselves and then come back together. It was very, that we had a very similar rapport with everyone. Um, so there was, there were no challenges on like, uh, some actors you are very different and the way you work is very different. So it's kind of hard to work opposite them because uh, they won't reciprocate what you need and vice versa. But on this production, I think it was very seamless. Yeah, I think part of that too was that um, our prep did involve all of us being able to sit and really go through the words. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit sneaky because you get to learn a lot as a director about the mind of each of the actors. And, you know, and if you feel like there is a disconnect, it's something to smooth out before you actually have to get there, which, um, but with these actors, it was great because they were so game and so available. I feel like you can feel the fact that you took the time to do that on screen in the finished product here. I'm gonna have to let you all go soon. You know what I have to ask you about. How, <laughs> how often are you asked about Stranger Things? In an effort to not ask you, is Chrissy gonna come back? I, I am really curious about the experience having like, that kind of fame and notoriety happen so fast and how that could change your personal goals just in terms of like you have this new platform now, you have this wider reach and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more opportunities coming your way post Stranger Things. What are some of your priorities in terms of the types of onset environments you wanna be on and the types of stories you wanna tell? I think my goals have stayed the same. They're just more in reach now, um, which is very nice. <laughs> um, I. I I just love telling stories that people can relate to and that I can relate to. And I think I get to keep doing that, which I'm very grateful for. But like, obviously Chrissy and Eddie are gonna fight for good in the Upside Down next oh, season. Yeah. Right. <laughs> just wanted to clear that up. Um, just a couple of fun questions to kind of get to know you both a little more. First one is, what is your must have on set, whether it's like your sides, a particular drink, something to pass the time when you have downtime, you name it. 
Um, I would say probably somebody following me around and telling me where my script is because I like to leave it in really random places all the time. Uh, you get spoiled also when you come, like when you were an actor because people do last looks. So I like it when people will do last looks for me as a director. Like they're constantly coming up to me being like, honey, you have like 16 pencils in your hair. Like you need to, you need to get it together. I respect you that so much. Two minimum. Yeah. Um, music and music, I think is a big one because you get to create your own space when you need it. And if you just have to shut down really, you know, and kind of go internal and just use your mind, you know, that's, yeah, I had an that's Anna a playlist. One. You had an Anna playlist. Mm -hmm. I made everybody do a playlist. I had a playlist yeah. for every character. I remember you were like, I need you. To, I was like, I already have it. Yeah, I know. I love it. I love it. So smart. What is on that playlist? I'd have to go back and see. <laughs> Once I retire a character, I leave their playlist for a little bit. Anna was very into the Beatles, yes. which like I was never a Beatles fan before, but I was like, Anna feels very. So I, I'm a Beatles fan now. <laughs> Solid choice right there. So what do you have to have with you on set? Probably sides. I, I have photographic memory, so I don't really need them, but it's like a security blanket. That is so incredibly impressive. How did you discover that you have a photographic memory? Um, my dad's dyslexic, so it takes him a long time to learn sides. And I would get like 14 pages of sides and read it once. And then I'd be like, OK, let's go. And my dad would be like, no, no, <laughs> not fair. <laughs> so incredibly impressive. Um, this is a really big question, but it's something that I've started to love asking for for you. What is your favorite part of the acting process that you love so much, whether it's like rehearsal, finding, you know, the unexpected magic that can happen on set, you name it. But then also, what is your least favorite part where you've recognized that there's an opportunity for growth on future projects and the same for you as a director? Um, for me, my favorite part is I can be very introverted and very shy and uh, insecure and Every character I play, I make much more confident than me, much more secure, much more proud of who they are. So I love getting to feel that for the period of filming. Um, something I need to grow in is, uh, I think, being more receptive towards other people's way of work and notes. And like you were a gem to work with. But, but I like, would never say that about you. You're well, no, there are some directors where the way they word things, I'm like, I resent that. <laughs> but I'll try it. <laughs> now and I work wanna... together again. I'll know that look on your face. Like, <laughs> you don't get that look. You don't. You're very nice to work with. <laughs> I love how everyone has a look. A, a buddy once said to me because we do like a like a movie talk show. He's like, when you don't like what I'm saying, you go like. Hmm. <laughs> And I've, wa I've watched past videos, he's, right. he's right, I do do that. <laughs> no, I think some directors know it because like, I'll just like start staring blankly at something behind them. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I need to process this. <laughs> Give me a moment. <laughs> How about for you, Amy? Favorite and least favorite? Um, you know, it's such a collective, you know, you, do, you don't make movies in a vacuum and you handpick the people that come together with their toolbox to deliver on the story that you all have decided to tell together. And so when you start to see that machine start to take off and you get to go into drive, it's really exciting because, you know, m movies are a miracle when they actually happen and all these elements come together. And so when you see that start to happen, it's, it's a thrill. And I love that part of it. And I love knowing that sometimes you just have to step back and let people do their job and they could probably come up with things that you've never envisioned if, as long as you give them the dignity and respect to do that. And that part of it for me is super fun. Um, I would say that we still have some broken financing models to get things accomplished. And it takes me a lot of deep breathing to not, you know, kind of run out and scream in the streets like, our methods of financing are limiting to a lot of people that it shouldn't be limiting to. And it gets really frustrating. And I think a lot of it is kind of antiquated. So I, um, but I try to behave. It's <laughs> a very good answer to that question. Though. I hope a lot of people who have the power to change that see this and actually act on it feel like they're going to make me let you leave soon. I'll <sighs> squeeze in one really silly one. I just love asking this question so much because you both have acting experience. Would you rather have to? fake sneeze or fake vomit in a scene? I think I fake vomit in everything I do. 
<laughs> oh, I've never had such a conundrum. I need to go start acting <laughs> That's again. That's the goal. Um, I, I would both, say, right? I think fake vomit would be a lot more fun. There's a lot more things involved. There's like the preamble and, you know. It can be fun when you yeah. don't actually have to vomit anything. Like in certain yeah. things, I, I didn't have to vomit anything. In other projects I've had to do, I have to like hold something in my mouth. Never mind. I think I'd rather sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> I o I always think sneeze is the easier thing because it's not as gross, but it seems so like to do a convincing fake yes. sneeze, to do a convincing like fake, like basic everyday anything, like convincing fake sneeze, convincing yeah. driving, convincing wake up, fall yeah. asleep. That stuff seems like the most challenging stuff yes. to me. <laughs> There's other things that are convincing to fake too, but. It <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're we're fake vomit across the board. Yes, I All think right. fake vomit. All right, I'm glad we've clarified <laughs> yeah. that. Now I can let you go. Congratulations Thank on Roost. So Thank much. you so much Thank for swinging by. Time. To everybody out there, keep an eye out for Roost and stay tuned for more TIFF 2022 interviews.